Welcome everybody. So this year's Image Lab seminar starts with a, a, with a really interesting talk on computability as an evolving concept from Ahmet Çevik. Uh, Ahmet Çevik is an associate professor of logic and foundations of mathematics. Uh, he works both in mathematical and philosophical domains. He received his PhD in mathematics from the University of Leeds in 2014. He was a postdoctoral post researcher in the Department of Mathematics at the University of California, Berkeley in 2015 uh, to 16. Uh, he has lectured in the philosophy department, mathematics department, and computer engineering departments in Middle East Technical University. Since 2018, he has been affili affiliated with the Gendarmerie and Coast Guard Academy in Ankara. And his research interests are logic, computability theory, and the philosophy of mathematics. So thank you, Ahmed, uh, joining us today. So we, uh, uh, the screen is yours. Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here and really happy to take place in the Image Lab seminar series. Um, so this is rather going to be a philosophical talk. Um, there won't be too much technical details, I mean, to make sure that the talk is accessible by uh, everyone. Um, so I'd like to talk about the concept of computability, uh, how it evolved, and to what direction it might evolve in the future. Okay, so, um, and please raise any, I mean, if you ask, if you want to ask any questions, just please go for it, okay. All right, um, so Robert Soar is a well-known computability theorist um, and he defines computation uh, as a process where we proceed from initially given objects you know, called inputs according to a fixed set of rules and what we call algorithm through a series of steps and arrive uh, at the end of these steps with a final result which we call the output, okay? So this is how SOAR um, defines the concept of computation. And the usage of the algorithmic method, in fact, goes as far back as to Euclid. A Euclid devised an algorithm for finding the greatest common divisor of any given two natural numbers. Now, there's an effective method for that. If you're given two natural numbers, we can find their greatest common divisor. Um, but physical devices could also carry out some computations. And in 1642, Pascal invented the first mechanical calculator, which could carry out basic arithmetical operations like you know, addition and subtraction. And the machine could also carry out multiplication and division through um, multiple repetitions of you know, subtraction and addition. And during the same time in 1671, Leibniz invented his stepped reconner, which could carry out all four arithmetical operations. And furthermore, taking square roots. And um, in 1837, Charles Babbage invented his analytical engine, uh, which could perform longer and more general calculations, okay? So we have these physical models uh, which could carry out effective computations. Um, and then with the emerge of the symbolic logic and the foundational crisis of mathematics, the concept of computation became a critical notion. Um, so the informal notion of computability has two main formalisms. Okay, so we have two main formalisms for computability. And these are recursive functions and Turing computability. Okay? And both were proved to be equivalent, and I will talk about that later. Um, but before the 19th century, mathematicians actually used um, the principle of defining functions by induction. So they defined functions by the inductive methods. Um, but at the end of the 19th century, Dedekind showed that these kinds of definitions, uh, they define a unique class of functions. And with the works of Piano, 
um, the class of primitive recursive functions was defined based on the following axioms. I'm, I just wrote here. So the first three axioms are called primitive, are called initial functions, initial functions for the primitive recursion. Uh, the first one is called the constant function. So all constant functions are primitive recursive, okay? So when you're given any natural number n, the function just maps to, uh, to, to a constant value k, okay? Uh, secondly, we have the successor function. So given any natural number, it, the function basically takes uh, the successor of that natural number. So that's also a primitive recursive. Okay. And the projection function, which takes a vector and an index i, and returns the ith element, so ith element of the vector. So this projection function is also a primitive recursive. So these are called initial functions, okay? One through uh, three. And based on these functions, um, if we are given primitive recursive functions, g, h, uh, h, zero to h, l, then so is f obtained by uh, these two rules, the substitution rule and the primitive recursion rule, okay? So uh, functions that are obtained by substitution and obtained by uh, primitive recursion, that is recursive calls. So these functions are also primitive recursive. Okay, okay but we see that um, not all effectively computable functions. I mean, when I say intuitively computable functions, I mean it in a general sense, okay? So not all effectively computable functions are primitive recursive because um, if we enumerate all primitive recursive functions, if we have a uniform enumeration for them, and if we denote uh, the ith primitive recursive function by fi, okay, let's suppose, uh -huh. then we can easily define another function g like like this so i'm not sure you can see the highlighted part okay so gn is defined as let's suppose we take the nth primitive recursive function on argument n and we know that this part is defined right because uh, primitive recursive functions are total in the sense that when we are given any natural number n we know that fn is it's always defined Okay, so that's, the, that's the property of primitive recursive functions. They are total. So we just take the nth primitive recursive function and run it on argument n, and then just add it one to it. So this defines G. And we note that G is computable in the intuitive sense, right? But not primitive recursive. Because um, if we assume that G is in the list somewhere in the kth line, say, well then, what is um, the kth recursive function on argument k? It's self-contradictory, right? So by diagonalization, uh, g cannot be in this list, right? So then, um, the moral of the story is that we must consider partial functions in order to capture the intuitive notion of computability, right? So total functions um, are not sufficient enough for us to capture the concept of effective computability, okay? So we need to go beyond total functions and define partial functions. So partial functions are functions which may not be defined on every argument, okay? Right, so, and then in, in 1934, Gödel in his lecture, um, notice that the class of primitive recursive functions. And so he actually used these functions in his uh, incompleteness paper in 1931, uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, his uh, seminal paper. Uh, but he noticed that these functions were not sufficient enough to capture the notion of computability. So he introduced a more general class, uh, what we call today general recursive functions. Um, and then, um, at the same time, Kleene, Stefan Cole Kleene introduced mu recursion by adding a kind of minimization operator 
And this is to allow open and search procedures that we have in algorithms, right? Because if you run some algorithms given no time limit, given no space limit, the algorithm may run just forever, right? It may not halt. So to capture that notion, Cleany introduces the minimization operator. So this is an operator that returns zero um, for the when the function value is uh, satisfied, okay? When, when the criteria is satisfied for that function. So, and then with this definition um, added to uh, the definition of primitive recursive functions, uh, he obtains the class of mu recursive functions, okay? So this is a more general class. And in 1936, Alonzo Church invents the lambda calculus, um, which I'm sure you all know. Uh, this is the uh, foundation of um, you know, programming languages um, and functional programming languages. And he claims that every effectively computable function corresponds to some lambda expression in, in this formal system, okay? And uh, based on this claim, he proved the unsolvability of the Entscheidungs problem. Entscheidungs problem in German, it uh, translates as the decision problem. And it is the problem of uh, determining whether a given first order statement in, uh, in a statement in first order logic is valid or not. Okay, so given any first order statement, um, it's to determine whether it's uh, true in every, in every interpretation or not. Okay, that's what we call a valid statement. A statement is valid if it's true in every interpretation. Now, of course, this is easily solved in propositional calculus because uh, we have the truth table method, right? So we can effectively find whether a propositional statement is a tautology or not, just by you know, following the truth table method. But uh, this was shown to be uh, unsolvable in first order predicate logic, okay? And Alonzo, Alonzo Church was the first person who proved the unsolvability of this problem, the Entscheidungs uh, problem. Okay, and then, um, so you can clearly see that um, early 20th century was the golden age of the foundations of mathematics, which led to the creation of uh, theoretical computer science. And Alan Turing, um, as the father of computer science considered by most people, he published a monumental paper in 1937 where he introduced what we call Turing machines. So, um, and he laid out certain conditions on calculations, okay? So a Turing machine is basically uh, an idealized human computer. Uh, it's, it has an infinite tape divided into cells on which we can write symbols, we can erase, erase symbols. We have a tape head which can move left or right. It has a finite control unit, it's a finite set of states. So I'm not going to define the formal definition because it's uh, rather boring and I'm, I'm sure you all know. But um, so Turing put certain conditions on the calculations. I mean, he analyzed what it means for functions to be calculable by an algorithm. So, and here are the conditions. So he says, uh, we have the finiteness condition first. Um, so this is to make sure that the computation, this is to make the computation carried out by humans in principle. So we have three finiteness condition. He says, the number of symbols, uh, the number of blocks observed at any moment, uh, the number of states must be finite. Okay, so this is to ensure that computations we do could be carried out by humans in principle, okay? Uh, and then we have the neighborhood conditions. Uh, we have three neighborhood conditions. Uh, the first one says that the computer can change the symbol only in an observed square, and then at most one symbol, okay? And then second condition says the computer can move to a different set of observed squares, but only within a certain bounded distance uh, of an observed square, okay? Uh, 
So the distance that we can that the tape head can move uh, can only be within the finite interval. And lastly, we have uh, C3, atomic operation. The atomic operation must depend only on the current state and the symbol in the observed square. So the neighborhood conditions essentially, uh, these are to make sure that the computation relies on the Newtonian conception of physics. Okay, so it's all, the computation is all mechanical and it doesn't go beyond the Newtonian mechanics. Um, and finally, we have the determinacy condition, which says that from the state and observed symbols, there is a unique atomic operation which could be performed. A determinacy condition is to make sure that the procedure is deterministic, essentially, right? So these are his um, conditions um, <clears throat> on effective procedures. Um, and his paper was distinguished for a couple of reasons. First reason was that he idealized, uh, he analyzed an idealized human computing agent. But what he essentially did was to, um, to construct a model, a formal model of a mathematician in action. You know, Turing, his motivation was to model uh, a proving mathematician. What mathematician does is well, he, he proves, he proves certain statements, right? So we basically start by writing symbols on the paper and we skip to the next line. We erase symbols maybe, and then we come to the end, right? Then we finish the proof and then the computation halts. So this was his original motivation to formalize the act of proving. Okay? So, so essentially the human computer is a formal mathematician for Turing. Um, and it's remarkable that he uh, talked about computers before even digital computers were invented. So, um, and secondly, he specified a remarkably simple formal device. It was very intuitive because uh, it was associated with physical mechanical device, right? I mean, it resembles a physical, almost like a, um, like a recorder. So he proved the equivalence to other formal models of computation. So all those models, uh, lambda calculus, um, mu recursive functions, general recursive functions, and Turing computable functions. So though those, um, these models are all equivalents, okay, in power. Um, so they all compute the same class of functions. Um, and in the same paper, uh, in his 1937 paper, he also proved the unsolvability of uh, Enscheidung's problem, Hilbert's Enscheidung's problem. Uh, Church proved it, you know, earlier with his lambda calculus, but he also, uh, Turing also proved the unsolvability using his own model, using Turing machines. So Enscheidung's problem is also unsolved by Turing machines. Um, and then lastly, uh, probably the most important is that he proposed a universal Turing machine, which could simulate other, uh, other Turing machines. Now, this is important because this lays out the foundations of programmable computers. So programmable computers is possible because universal Turing machine exists. So this is a mathematical theorem, actually. Um, he proved the existence of a universal Turing machine. Okay. Now, um, his model was accepted as the correct model for computation by many leading figures at the time, um, including Kurt Gödel, Alonzo Church, and Stefan Cole Kleene. Uh, so these are three big names in mathematical logic. There are probably more, but... Uh, um, they were in, in the center in mathematical logic. Gödel says, this really is the correct definition of mechanical computability was established beyond any doubt by Turing. Uh, and Kleene says, Turing's computability is intrinsically persuasive. And another uh, philosophy of, uh, researcher in philosophy of computing, Wilfried Sieg, um, at 
Carnegie Mellon, says Turing's clarification, clarification of effective calculability as calcul calculability by a mechanical computer should be accepted. Notice how he spells computer. He says computer. So Wilfred Sieg distinguishes digital computers from Turing's idealized uh, computer, human idealized computer. And he spells it with O. So he refers to uh, Turing's idealized, human idealized computer, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so if, if I go too fast, just let me know. Okay, so and then um, it was shown that all these models of effective computability uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, so these are known to be equivalent, okay? Uh, Turing machines, mu, mu recursive functions, lambda calculus functions, so they compute the same class of functions, but What's different with Turing machine is that it's natural. I mean, you could see the reactions, the positive reactions from Gödel, Church, and uh, Kalini, that they naturally describe the concept of uh, effective computability. So uh, we have the following thesis then, and it was originally back then called the Church thesis, uh, which was adapted to only lambda calculus functions. But then with Turing's model, uh, we have the Church-Turing thesis, which says that effective computability is actually Turing computability. So this means that whatever is intuitively computable, you know, computable in the intuitive sense, is also computable by a Turing machine and vice versa, right? But that's, uh, that's very obvious. Um, the critical direction here is the forward direction. If a function is computable in the intuitive sense, if it's effectively computable, then it's Turing computable, okay? And this is, um, you know, this is a philosophical thesis, of course, it's not a mathematical statement. Um, and various uh, versions of church Turing thesis uh, have been proposed, uh, particularly by Piccinini in uh, 2007, he suggests the following variants, uh, he talks about the physical church string thesis. And the physical church string thesis, he writes it as physical computability is equal to Turing computability. So it's basically whatever is physically computable is actually Turing computable. Whereas in the standard conceptual, you know, standard church string thesis, here the word effective computability refers to conceptual, you know versus conceptual computations, not necessarily physical. Right? So we're talking about mathematical computability here. Um, but with this version, uh, we're talking about literally physical devices. So uh, we take it at face value. Uh, it says physical computability is equal to Turing computability. Uh, and then he gives another version, the human church Turing thesis, and he restricts computability to humans. Uh, and it basically says human computability is equivalent to Turing computability. So whatever is computable by human being physically, you know, then it's Turing computable, okay? And vice versa. So that's, that's the human church Turing thesis. And, and he um, further suggests two versions of the physical church Turing thesis, the modest and bold versions. Uh, the former version, the modest version, claims that any physically computable process is Turing computable, okay? So we're talking about uh, two sub, you know, versions of the physical church Turing thesis. Modest version, says that any physically computable process is Turing computable. The bold version, on the other hand, says that any physical process, regardless of whether it's computable or not, is Turing computable. Okay. Okay, so it's very easy to confuse about, to get confused about the church Turing thesis. So um, whenever I talk about the church Turing thesis, you know, I also want to discuss about what the thesis is not, 
Now, the church Turing thesis does not say that there is a limit to all possible computing systems, whatever that means, okay? Whatever we mean by system. So that's first thing that it does not mean. And secondly, it does not say that minds are machines because we do not know if the human mind works in an algorithmic, you know, or in an effective fashion. There is no uh, scientific uh, finding like that. And finally, um, uh, from the point of view of Piccinini's work, uh, the church string thesis does not necessarily imply computationalism. And what is computationalism? Well, it basically says that the cognition is a type of computation, it says. So that all cognitive capacities of the mind have a computational explanation, okay? Uh, so uh, the thesis does not imply does not necessarily imply computationalism. Now, we know that um, all effective computations can be carried out by Turing machines because of uh, the equivalence property that all uh, models were shown to be equivalent to each other. Uh, it was shown by Turing, but okay, there's, uh, however, we can still modify our conception of algorithm so as to include processes that compute with real numbers instead of natural numbers. So we can extend uh, our conception of algorithm uh, to go beyond uh, computation uh, with natural numbers. Of course, this depends on how much we distinguish definability and computability. That is, um, do we mean do we merely mean definability when we say computability? Are they equivalent or are they different? So this depends on how we distinguish these two terms. So if we're not required to restrict ourselves with uh, Turing mechanics, then we can easily redefine the concept of computation or computability um, uh, to include other forms of processes, other forms of tasks as legitimate computable processes, okay? Now, <clears throat> the first approach that we could take um, is the definableist approach, okay? That is to define uh, the concept of computability once and for all in an unchanging, you know, uh, in an unchanging manner, okay? And not, not to change a definition in the future. So the definableism is the view that a concept can be completely described by a fixed uh, definition. And we all know that the earliest definableist doctrine, we can say, uh, was the Pythagoreanist dictum, right? Pythagoreanism basically said that, you know, all these numbers, uh, that's what it claimed. Everything in the universe but particularly geometric magnitudes could be uh, constructed by ratios of natural numbers. That's what Pythagoreanism um, claimed. Uh, so in this sense, it can be said that natural numbers have this expressive power for describing objects in the universe, right? So what, what it says that, well, all we need is just natural numbers and their ratios to express things to express the objects in the universe. So this attributes the exp an expressive completeness to natural numbers, right? So I can say that um, natural numbers are expressively complete according to Pythagoreanism um, because of the fact that, you know, for them uh, that they describe objects uh, properly uh, in the universe. Um, but we know that, you know, Pythagoreanism was refuted by the Pythagoreans themselves by finding uh, the uh, square root of two, you know, the uh, finding incommensurability. Um, but I argue this in my book and elsewhere that the church Turing thesis is in fact another form of Pythagoreanism for the computability paradigm. I mean, we only restrict our attention to Turing mechanics when we try to define the intuitive concept of uh, computability. 
Now, the church Turing thesis says that effective computability can be reduced uh, to computations over natural numbers. In other words, uh, Turing mechanics, right? So Turing mechanics is all we need to define uh, the concept of computation. And according to this, there is no effective computation which lies beyond the expressive power of Turing mechanics. Right? Um, so Turing mechanics are sufficient enough to express uh, any computation that could be carried out intuitively. Okay? So um, natural numbers have the same property in Pythagoreanism. So that's why uh, I'm arguing that the church string thesis is another form in the computability arena, of course, right? Not for expressing objects in the universe, but in terms of defining computability, the church string thesis is in the form of a definableist uh, dictum, right? Uh, like, the, like Pythagoreanism. So we can take a definableist approach, or we could look for the square root of effective computability by exceeding the church uh, Turing barrier. Okay. Now, um, there's a good reason to believe in the uh, validity of the church Turing thesis. I mean, it hasn't been proved or disproved um, for the fact that it's not a mathematical statement, right? I mean, because Turing machines, on one hand, Turing machine is a mathematical model, but on the other hand, effective computability is, is a philosophical term, right? It's, it's not a mathematically well-defined uh, concept. So remember the church Turing thesis says that anything effectively computable is Turing computable. So the left-hand side is an intuitive term, is a non-mathematical term, the right-hand side is a mathematical model. So that's why this thesis cannot be formally proved or disproved using uh, any axioms. Okay, so, uh, but relying on the last 85 years, relying on our um, experience with computer science and mathematical logic, many logicians and computer scientists believe that the church Turing thesis um, is the correct definition of computability. I mean, by most mathematicians, Turing thesis is the definition of computability, but um, it, it still it can be countered either by A, either by finding a Turing computable function, uh, which does not seem to be intuitively computable. Now, this is less possible, it's very hard. And it's very counterintuitive, in my opinion, finding a Turing computable function which does not seem to be intuitively computable. It's um, it's a bit counterintuitive. So this is the less possible option for us. But what's more possible is that we could find a process that is computable conceptually, or physically, or theoretical physically, but that cannot be carried out by Turing machines. Now this is more possible, and this is what I would like to uh, continue on talking about. Um, one possible uh, candidate would be hypercomputation, or in other words, supertasks. Um, you may find it feasible or not, but supertasks may be taken as a new paradigm for computability or second order structures like real numbers. So essentially it's computation over real numbers instead of natural numbers. Um, uh, because we call that Turing machines are defined over, you know, Turing machine computations are defined over natural, natural numbers. The input is a finite string. Output is another finite string. So it's defined from a finite alphabet to finite alphabet. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the set of all words over a finite alphabet and the set of natural numbers. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So standard Turing calculations are based on natural numbers. So Turing mechanics, hence, are based on uh, natural numbers and their mappings. Okay, um, so hypercomputation 
uh, is considered as a new paradigm for compatibility over real numbers. Um, so what is hypercomputation or supertask? Well, supertask is uh, it's basically computing, completing a countable infinite task within a finite interval of time. Uh, so I'm sure you recall Zeno's paradox, right? Um, and there's a there's a version, there's a there's a counterpart uh, for the model of computation for that. It's called accelerating Turing machines. Now, accelerating Turing machines is a hypothetical model which uh, computes a task half the time uh, it computed its previous task, okay? So we start with our first task. If we do it in one second, then our second task will be in half a second. Then our next task will be in quarter seconds. And by the end of two seconds, the machine will have you know, performed infinitely many tasks, countably infinitely many tasks, right? So this is an example to a super task model. Now, so what can we do with uh, this kind of model of computation, you may ask? Well, obviously we can solve the enchantings problem, right? Uh, we can determine whether or not any given statement in first order predicate calculus is valid or not, right? So it becomes solvable. And so does the halting problem, right? Uh, so halting problem, uh, if you remember, it's the problem whether or not a given algorithm uh, halts on a given input. So uh, these two problems and many others, many others um, become solvable uh, by super task models of computation. So these problems are known to be unsolvable by classical Turing machines, uh, but it's possible to solve them by hypercomputation. Now, what about the possibility of these models? I mean, do they exist or are they conceptually uh, possible? Um, is it possible to realize them? Is it feasible? So the conceptual possibility was uh, criticized by Thompson, uh, J.F. Thompson, a British philosopher in 1954. And Paul ben Seraf, a philosopher of mathematics and logician, and criticized Thompson's criticism. Okay? But this is not to argue that you know, super tasks are conceptually possible. No, Benesaraf simply merely criticizes uh, Thompson's criticism, uh, nothing more. Um, but then in 2000, mathematical, a mathematical model of uh, super task computation or hyper computation was introduced by Joel David Hempkins and uh, Andrew Lewis they introduce infinite time uh, Turing machines. So infinite time Turing machines, I mean, it's a very interesting paper. Um, so please take a look if you have a chance. Uh, so it's a it looks like a standard Turing machine containing an infinite tape, three infinite tape, uh, as far as I remember, a scratch tape, a work tape, and um, some other tape that I don't remember right now. Um, it's so at Finite stages at each next stage, the infinite time Turing machine is defined exactly as a standard Turing machine. The only difference is that infinite time Turing machines uh, are defined on limit stages. They are defined at limit ordinal stages. So it has a limit uh, action, a separately defined limit action. Um, so it's compatibility over ordinals, essentially, okay? Uh, transfinite ordinals. So with this model, um, problems that are unsolvable by standard Turing machines are still uh, solvable by infinite time Turing machines. Though, of course, the self-halting problem is still unsolvable by the infinite time Turing machine. So um, no matter how powerful our model is we can never solve the self-halting problem with that same machine. It's like a diagonalization argument. I mean, we can never get away from that, okay? Um, so what's more interesting here is that um, some authors even show the physical possibility of performing super tasks, 
I mean, when I say physical, I mean theoretical physical. So Etesi and Nemeti, two Hungarian mathematicians and physicists, showed that there are space-time structures uh, which are consistent with general relativity in which performing super tasks near rotating black holes is possible. So, you know, computation is usually um, a nature inspired. Nature is the like best computer, right? I mean, we take our inspirations from the nature. So rotating black holes in this special space-time structure is called melamed hogarth space-time which is consistent with general relativity. In those space-time, uh, we can, using the concept of time dilation, uh, like we have one observer and one computer, and uh, using the time dilation and using the properties of these space-time structures, near rotating black holes, we can perform hypercomputation. Okay. And uh, in 2013, Musha, proved the possibility of um, the possibility of hypercomputation using superluminal particles through uh, quantum tunneling. Superluminal particles are you know hypothetical particles which can uh, travel faster than light. And quantum tunneling is basically the propagation of wave functions through thin barriers. That's the quantum tunneling uh, property. Okay. okay, so my point is then, um, why do we need new objects in computer science? Not only in computer science, but in mathematics as well. Um, and I'm arguing this from mathematical, um, from a naturalist viewpoint. Okay. Now, from a naturalist viewpoint, we've always seemed to add in uh, new objects to our conceptions, whether, whether it's about computation, whether it's about um, geometry, whether it's about uh, functions. Okay. So we always, you know, tend to add new objects. First, we accepted irrational numbers in our number system with uh, the existence of uh, incommensurables. And then we accept the existence of infinitesimals uh, with calculus, right? So an infinitesimal number is, is, uh, is a number, is a positive number, uh, which is greater than zero, but which is less than every real number greater than zero. So it's minimal above zero, right? So that's infinitesimal. Uh, and it's used in the epsilon delta definition of uh, limits, uh, if you recall. Uh, and, then, and then came the non-Euclidean spaces. So we extended our conception of geometry with non-Euclidean spaces because uh, in ancient Greek, physical space was known, as, was known to be restricted to this Euclidean spaces. It was believed to be modeled by the Euclidean conception of space. But with the foundation, with the works of um, Gauss and others, uh, we now know uh, the existence of non-Euclidean spaces, elliptic, space, elliptic spaces and hyperbolic spaces. And um, the crisis back then was that uh, Euclid's fifth axiom is false in these spaces. The parallel postulate axiom is false in these uh, non-Euclidean spaces. Uh, so there was a serious crisis back then. Um, and in the last century, we accepted uh, in a branch called set theory. It's a branch of mathematical logic. So we accepted what is known as forcing extensions as new mathematical objects. So these objects, they extend the set theoretical universe. So we accepted these objects um, as a part of our, you know, uh, conception uh, of sets. Uh, and in computer science, we accepted using quantum mechanical principles in our computations, like su superposition principle, interferences. We use electrons and photons as medium, right? So, um, so there is a progress, certainly um, some progression is made through time. 
So our natural tendency is then to add in new objects about that conception that are useful for our scientific theories. So this is basically naturalism. Um, uh, and I can say that computation is also an involving notion. I mean, the criteria for effective compatibility uh, can be revised. And objects like supertask procedures, you know, hypercomputation uh, may well be accepted as a part of our conception of effective compatibility using the natural resources uh, of the universe, such as quantum mechanical uh, properties or uh, may it be rotating uh, black holes or other physical phenomena. Right? So um, that's, my, that's my point and, and my talk. Um, thank you for listening. These are my references if you want to take a look. So thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much for this uh, mind-opening uh, talk. Well, do we have any questions? Altojam, I think you have a question. Yeah, I have a question. And okay, thank you for, uh, for this nice presentation. Uh, so I, I think, I mean, I, I guess we can uh, safely uh, deduct, deduce from your presentation that the church Turing thesis is limited to uh, natural number computations. Yeah. So we must not uh, no, over, overstate it. I mean, as far as uh, computations on uh, finite objects are concerned, Church Turing thesis can be uh, accepted. I mean, uh, however, uh, when we consider infinite objects, uh, I mean, the, the situation is different and we don't have to accept church, church Turing thesis. Matter of fact, it is plain wrong uh, when we consider non-natural uh, non number objects. Actually, the, uh, we don't have to go very far to, you know, uh, galaxies out there, uh, black holes, and, uh, you know, relativistic computation and all that. I mean, the, the examples are very near. Uh, actually, my example comes from a programming language theory, but it is closely meshed with lambda calculus. Uh, there is a language called PCF, Programming with Computable Functions, uh, due to Gordon Plotkin. Uh, plot PCF uh, is equivalent in power to lambda calculus and Turing machines. Uh, and uh, Plotkin uh, proved that some operations are not expressible in, in PCF. One, uh, an easy one is uh, parallel OR operation. Uh, parallel OR, I mean, you are taking this junction of two things, okay? Um, so there is a process, as uh, Ahmed Oja mentioned, very implementable process, okay? One pro that, so there are two processes. Uh, they both result in, they may result in true or false outcome, or they may run forever. And you are taking their logical OR. So if one of the processes finish and uh, let's say give you a, a true result, the, the result will be true without looking at the other process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you get the idea. I mean, that's the parallel OR. The whole process, of course, runs uh, to infinity if uh, both run to infinity. So this is a parallel OR operation, and it is quite computable. I mean, you can uh, give this as a homework <clears throat> to uh, in an introductory course in parallel computing. So you cannot, I don't think it can be denied that it is computable, I mean, because it is done <laughs> Uh, as a, a homework. Uh, 
Yet it is not expressible in PCF. Uh, that has been proven by Platkin in 1977. So this then uh, that means uh, it defies the church Turing thesis. Uh, if it is understood beyond uh, natural number computations. Actually, this was the first condition of Turing himself. Uh, <clears throat> so you see, it's a very mundane thing, uh, you know, parallel computing. It's a very mundane uh, practice. Uh, computer scientists and programmers do perform parallel computing uh, every day. We don't even think about it. But uh, it requires us to revise our understanding of uh, church Turing thesis. So we don't have to go very, very far. Mm -hmm. That's what I am saying. And the examples are everywhere. Uh, so if you consider, you know, control type of applications, uh, you know, uh, in any kind of embedded, most embedded software, would not be Turing uh, computable because uh, they they won't be running on uh, finite tapes. They won't be running on integers. So uh, actually, we uh, defy uh, Church Turing thesis narrowly understood regularly. <laughs> uh, so uh, so that my point is that uh, Ahmed Hoca gave examples of. Uh, you know, to extend our notion. But what I'm saying is that it's a very mundane thing to extend it. Uh, so our look at what uh, every, what is going on in everyday computation. So uh, as computer scientists, uh, we are not bound by Church Turing thesis to begin with. Mm -hmm. So whenever the first, you know, uh, microcontrollers were invented, we defied the church during thesis. So it doesn't bind, our, it shouldn't, it should never bind our thinking, our uh, conception at all. So in my mind, uh, it is relevant only a small portion of, uh, you know, some uh, of the, of our universe. Okay, mm -hmm. I think I, I would like to regard uh, Church Turing thesis and Turing computation is a small world. It is of interest, but we live in a much, much, much uh, large, larger world. Already we are living in it. Uh, and we have been living in it for a long time. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So just to make sure that I understood correctly, um, was so it, PCF is a formal system, right? And yes. was it shown to be uh, equivalent in power to Turing machines? Yes, weaker yes. than Turing machines. Yeah, yeah there is a proof uh, for that. It's, it's uh, you know, yes. Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> so and they're equivalent with other models of computation. You're saying, right? So there is a proof that uh, partial recursive functions are expressible in PCF. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, you can uh, express during machine computations in PCF. Uh -huh. Yet, uh, yet uh, there is a proof that you cannot express parallel or operation in PCF. And can you express this in? Like, can you express this using Turing machines? The same problem. Yeah, I don't think so, but. Uh, but you can, uh, it of course, be. device device uh, a, a, you know a more powerful kind of Turing machine that can uh, you know perform this process mm -hmm. of you know interleaving of two parallel processes. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be done, but then it won't be a Turing machine anymore. It would be some kind of you know extended model. And, yeah, that's okay. Uh, um, and as far as I understand, uh, these two uh, components, you know, we run uh, two propositions and we take their parallel, or um, we quantify them over an infinite domain. Um, and we might be assuming that the domain is unstructured here, 
So that's why the problem is unsolvable because solvability has to do with, it has nothing to do with the, with the, the cardinality of the domain, but it has to do with the structure. I gave this example just last week in my class. Um, suppose that we have enumerated the Fibonacci sequence and we ask whether a particular number belongs to that sequence or not. Now, although we are quantifying over an infinite domain, this does not mean that the problem becomes unsolvable because the structure, the Fibonacci structure is, is a, an increasing structure. So when we ask whether a natural number belongs to that sequence, well, we look at from the beginning one by one. And then when we see a number that exceeds that number, that exceeds the input, we say, well, no, the number cannot exist in the remaining sequence. So the, uh, whether something is computable or not, merely relies on, merely based on uh, whether the domain is structured or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I, I, assume that, this, uh, I, I assume that P and Q are quantified over a domain which has no structure. Yeah, you take them as processes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, you can say that. Uh, because from the outset, we are assuming that um, there is a process. Uh, we, we are not talking about its structure. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't know whether it will terminate or not. Um, so it, if it terminates, we are going to grab its output and use it. But if it doesn't terminate, we cannot. So we are not making an assumption about the structure of that process. Hmm. But that's the case. I mean, that's the world we live in. A matter of fact, so that's not uh, our far-fetched uh, contrived example because in as, as some software developers do, do that all the time. I mean, you, 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 you take a piece of software and use it mm -hmm. without knowing what is going on inside, but you are interested in its result. Okay, so I mean, that's, uh, that's quite realistic. I mean, not, not only realistic, but it is mundane. Yes. So Ali Soja is saying that uh, I think that computer scientists uh, no longer worry about the halting problem. Uh, worry, worrying about halting problem. Uh, there, there is such a problem. Uh, what I'm saying is engineers don't worry about the halting problem much. Uh, they, they worry about it as much as uh, P equals MP problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, any other questions or comments? I think let me stop the recording. Thank you, Ahmed, once again. It was very yes, nice. Yes, thank you very much for having me.